Hi, this is Mrs. Murdoch, and this is my talk on the chemistry of hemoglobin. So hemoglobin is one of my favorite proteins. It uh, comes up again and again in the AP Bio class, and it's a um, really good molecule to become familiar with and a good example of a protein that shows all four levels of structure. So first of all, what you might notice is you've got a picture here of some red blood cells. That's what you're looking at. Red blood cells are basically not much more than sacs filled with millions of molecules of hemoglobin. That's what they are. Filled with hemoglobin and really not much else. Hemoglobin molecules. Remember, hemoglobin is molecules, and red blood cells are cells that are filled with these chemicals, with these chem hemoglobin protein molecules. Okay. So, you probably know that red blood cells carry oxygen around the body, and in order to do that, um, they have to have a certain shape. If you look at the shape of these red blood cells, they're nice and round and soft looking. They even have a bit of a, um, uh, a sort of a donut shape in the middle. They don't have a nucleus. They're smaller than lots of the other human cells in your body. And they actually need to be small because they have to fit through the tiny capillaries. So if I were to draw what I mean by tiny capillaries, you have the tiniest blood vessels in your body um, are very thin-walled and they're very small and they go past your body cells. So let's say these are body cells. Maybe they're muscle cells, maybe they're skin cells, but there's not a body cell in your body that doesn't have a tiny little capillary going right by it. And inside, inside that capillary are the red blood cells. So if I go up here, the red blood cells travel through here. And a lot of times they're even squished up against the wall inside the capillary, which is that tiny tube. Very thin walls in capillaries. So the oxygen that is inside those red blood cells can diffuse out of their cytoplasms and into the body cells. So that is how your body cells get oxygen. They're carried there by the red blood cells that pick it up in your lungs and then are distributed through every tiny capillary that you have in your body, and that's, that's how that works. Now let's go to the molecular level of that. So if we go down here, you have these two interesting shapes. All right. They are very closely related to each other. The left shape is actually a hemoglobin molecule, the entire protein, hemoglobin protein. And remember that this is a protein that is made of um, an amino acid sequence, a sequence that is um, the primary sequence is just the sequence of amino acids that you've already learned about in your pattern matching. The secondary structure is those amino acids may uh, curve into an alpha helix or a beta pleated sheet. Then you take that alpha helix and you fold it. And what you get is what, what those balloon animals look like on the screen. They're not showing every amino acid there. They're showing the, um, the little dots that I'm drawing are the amino acids that are curved into maybe an alpha helix and then in turn folded, folded into this bent sort of balloon animal shape that curves around like this, and that's its tertiary structure. So you see, so there's a tertiary structure there that is made up ultimately of the chain of amino acids that's been um, um, linked up and then twisted and then folded again, right? Um, so the amino acids that you learned about are still there. They're just not shown in this picture because there would be no way to show every carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, and nitrogen, and all that in the amino acids here that wouldn't be conducive to showing you what the structure of the protein really is. Okay. So the quaternary structure is that you have one polypeptide here, but then you have a different one, kind of the pink one here, 
is a different polypeptide that's also a sequence of amino acids that's been folded up. And then again, you have a third polypeptide that's all folded up attached to that, and then a fourth. So you have quaternary structure. You have more than one polypeptide uh, attached to other polypeptides to make the entire hemoglobin. Each poly polypeptide is called a globin. And there are two beta globins. These two orange ones are on top are the beta globins. And then there are two alpha globins, which are the pink ones on the bottom. And that makes up the hemoglobin. The question is, what are these interesting blue things here that are sort of incorporated almost like an afterthought in there? All right. So what these are are heme groups. And the heme group, the, a larger picture of it is right here. This is not a protein. This is an additional functional group that is added to a protein, right? So this is a heme group. And you can kind of look at it like a disc shape that then finds itself in those four different blue circular places in the bigger hemoglobin molecule. And it's very, very important. The heme group is what makes the hemoglobin able to carry oxygen. So as you see, there is an iron ion in the center of it, which likes oxygen gas very much. So oxygen gas can be bound temporarily to that iron ion and thus carried on a, in a hemoglobin protein. And in fact, there are four places for oxygen gas molecules to bind temporarily in this hemoglobin. And then if you go to the red blood cell, in turn, you have, you have millions and millions of hemoglobin molecules that are inside the red blood cell, right? That are each carrying oxygen that you breathed in in your lungs and then go off to your body cells to fit inside those tiny capillaries. And, um, and distribute oxygen where, it, where it's needed. Okay, so that's not the end of my story today. I want to talk a little bit about what happens when something goes wrong with the shape of the molecule. How can something going wrong with the shape of a molecule affect the shape of the cell? Because that's exactly what happens with something called sickle cell anemia. So on this side, we're going to talk about the protein shape of normal hemoglobin, and on this side we're going to discuss what happens with sickle-shaped hemoglobin. So before you even get to the structure of a protein, you need to understand that the structure of a protein depends on the sequence, the base sequence, of, uh, in DNA. And some part of your brain from freshman year remembers this, I promise you. So, for example, remember there's A's and T's and C's and G's in the DNA molecule. Those ladders, the steps of the ladder are made of pairs of bases. So, when proteins are made in cells, they rely on the information of the DNA base sequence to be translated into a sequence of amino acids. So, for example, I'm just going to make these letters up here. If you had adenine, adenine, cytosine, guanine, 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 cytosine, adenine, guanine, maybe cytosine, cytosine, cytosine. Okay, so let's say that that's our DNA base sequence in a very, very small section of the hemoglobin gene. And we look at them three at a time because, uh, you may vaguely remember this, every set of three nucleotide bases codes for a single amino acid, code for a single amino acid. And this one might code for a different amino acid than this one, right? And as a result of that, right, you get the primary structure of a protein, which is just the sequence of amino acids, right? So valine would be in position one, then there's histidine and leucine and threonine and proline, and there's glutamine in position six here, and another glutamine in position seven, right? Position six and seven in a very, very long polypeptide. They're not showing you the whole thing. They're only showing you the part where the mutation happens to make things go abnormal. 
Okay, so let's say over here on the sickle cell side, we have the exact same sequence. Everything's all fine. Everything's all good until sometime, maybe a couple thousand years ago, this happened. This is different than that. That's called a substitution mutation. And it can happen. In DNA replication, sometimes the wrong, um, the wrong base is placed where it shouldn't be, and that's a change. And sometimes, not every time, that change can result in a different amino acid in that position. So now we have valine in a position where there should have been a glutamine. And that seems like, Jesus, an amino, one amino acid in like two or 300 amino acids, how could that make that much difference? It turns out it really does make a big difference. And here's the difference. Glutamine is right here. In its place, valine is right here. Now you remember this, that valine is actually hydrophobic. So it's pulling this part of the globin inward and causing this dip, which behaves very, very badly in a hemoglobin molecule. The glutamine is hydrophilic, so it's pulling the, the chain outwards. Therefore, the tertiary structure of that normal beta globin is nice and round, whereas the tertiary structure here has this kind of hook in it. And if you keep going up the different levels of organization, you find that that has a cascading effect on the overall shape of both hemoglobin the whole hemoglobin normal molecule, see all the nice smooth edges, this is normal hemoglobin. Whereas the sickle-shaped hemoglobin literally has these hooks in it because that valine is hydrophobic and hiding from the water and pulling those edges in. So this is sickled hemoglobin. And remember, we're still in the molecular world here. We're not in the cellular world. So what happens? Eventually, here's what happens. Those sickle-celled molecules have a tendency to hook up with each other, attach to each other, and form these long crystals of hemoglobin, these long crystals that are kind of like needles or tent poles inside a red blood cell. So that finally has an effect at the cellular level. You have millions of molecules forming these needle-like um, tent poles, crystallized hemoglobins that are long and thin and, and don't hold oxygen very well, and are poking the red blood cell into the wrong position, right? So those crystallized hemoglobin molecules, chemo globins um, cause distorted red blood cells, which leads to all of the sickle cell anemia symptoms you may have heard about, sickle cell anemia symptoms which are all over the body because the blood goes everywhere. And if your blood cells are in a, a hook shape position, imagine how that works in tiny little capillaries, all those little hooks trying to, to go through there. They form clogs, they catch on each other, they form all kinds of, 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 um, of problems, circulatory problems. Whereas the nice round normal hemoglobins stay separate, they don't crystallize, and those cells stay nice and round and soft and go through the capillaries just fine. So that's the story of how one little mutation, one little mutation caused all these problems, um, both from the protein molecule all through those levels and finally to the cellular level, and then finally to the tissue organ level of a human being. It doesn't always happen that way. One mutation or one change in the primary sequence does not always cause all these problems. In this case, it did. So I, um, that's all about hemoglobin and sickle cell anemia, and I hope that was helpful.